So as opposed to what you just saw from a Boshan at the Cleveland Clinic, which is stuff you shouldn't try at home or in your endoscopy center, I'm going to go on to uh, things that most of us have been doing or can try at home or preferably not at home uh, that might be helping your day-to-day -day patient. And just as an aside, if you ever have a sort of patient that needs Bose kind of treatment, he is the ultimate gentleman in seeing your patient, getting back to you in the same day. Their operation is unbelievable. So I'm making a plug for the Cleveland Clinic for your disaster or extremely uh, complex pouch patients for Bo. So I'm going to be speaking about capsule endoscopy and double balloon enteroscopy. Um, in the small bowel. I'm not going to talk about the pill cam colon, uh, which is a, the newest development and emerging data in terms of evaluating both Crohn's and UC uh, for pan uh, colonic disease when we want to avoid repeated colonoscopies. So it's all about uh, clinical scenario and clinical context. And we're going to look at clinical histories that are virtually identical. And I'll show a slide presented as an unknown and then rewind and look at it again. So the first uh, video is a 22-year-old uh, pre-finals college sophomore, drinks a couple of cans of beer in the week prior to presenting to you, and now presents with abdominal pain, nausea. Let's look at it again. So do we think this patient has a chronic inflammatory disease. At 12 o'clock, you see that mucosal break. Can we tell this patient with new onset abdominal pain, crampy postprandial pain, that this is Crohn's disease? Does anybody here vote for Crohn's disease? So the answer is no, and it's important to recognize because if you look at the literature comparing capsule endoscopy to other modalities, it's found to be more predictive than uh, CT, E, M, R, E. And this is simply because they had a self-definition of three mucosal breaks equals uh, Crohn's disease. So this is important to recognize that it is not enough to make a diagnosis of Crohn's based on your very soft findings. And think of about it in the colon. If you saw this in the colon, no one would think three mucosal breaks equal Crohn's disease. If you see this in the small bowel, and there are no inflammatory markers, and the patient sounds like IBS, then it's IBS. Remember, IBS doesn't respond well to our potent medications in IBD. You might think this patient has small bowel Crohn's disease. You start the patient on five ASAs, which is usually never the right answer for small bowel disease. That doesn't work. The patient continues to have crampy abdominal pain. It's steroids, it's anti-TNFs, it's thiopurines. The patient doesn't get better, and you're off to the races with all these uh, treatments. It doesn't work because IBS doesn't respond to these drugs. So make sure you have a firm diagnosis of Crohn's disease. Don't make it on uh, three mucosal breaks as was defined in some of the early studies. The next uh, video is the same patient who has had these same symptoms for the last semester, crampy abdominal pain, drinks a couple of beers once a week, Saturday night, has lost three pounds, and it's essentially the same patient, and this is a semester later. Let's run that again. So is this any different? Is this sufficient to move on to a diagnosis beyond IBS? And I think we recognize that there's a great deal of edema on the folds, clearly stellate ulcers here. And in this case, I think that, again, in the proper clinical context, we're going to feel comfortable making the diagnosis of Crohn's disease. Now, again, we have to put it into context. I think these are adequate in the proper context. Patient may have a family history. Patient is not taking large amounts of NSAIDs that might also uh, explain these findings. And remember, NSAIDs can cause every Crohn's appearance in the small bowel. Next slide. Same patient again, different patient, same history try and make the diagnosis, and again, 
fairly straightforward, stellate ulcers, and I think a pretty good rule of thumb is if you're looking in the small bowel and you're thinking about what this would look like in the Crohn's, in the colon, would this make you, help you make a diagnosis of Crohn's disease? I think that's a pretty good rule of thumb. The much bigger uh, risk we have is overdiagnosing Crohn's in a patient who sounds like IBS. All the parameters for IBS are present. There are no inflammatory markers. We see a couple of mucosal breaks, and we're ready to call it Crohn's disease. Can we see the next slide, please? 32-year-old woman going through a divorce. Not this side. Next uh, video, please. Going through a divorce, has lost six pounds. Hemoglobin is 13. Postprandial abdominal pain. And this is read as nodular, nodularity in the small bowel. Now remember that one of the, let's stop there, one of the criteria for the scoring in the Lewis uh, scoring system is a villus edema. So if you just have little pinpoint edema on the villi, that's not nodularity. Let's go to the next slide where we can really see something that uh, qualifies for nodularity. Next slide, it's not this one. Next slide, please. Okay, here, excuse me. So let's play that one again. So nodularity beyond villus edema, again, you have to think of a, a differential diagnosis, and we'll see several cases of nodularity. These days, we don't have to guess at what the diagnosis is based on the uh, clinical scenario. We have the benefit of double balloons. I'm not going to speak in terms of the different uh, enters long uh, scopes in the uh, small bowel, whether it's from above or below. But with diagnostic challenges, and we see nodularity, we're not sure what it is. Biopsies are now possible. We see the next, uh, the next slide, please. Next video. Okay, another patient. I think we recognize the nodularity here. Obviously, more clinically evident. Again, is it specific? No. Do we see ulcerations on this? No. The patient has lost four pounds, 36 year old five pounds of uh, continued weight loss after we initially see the patient with mild inflammatory markers. And let's see the next video. And this patient, when we get down deeper with a double balloon enteroscope, this is what it looks like in the mid-jejunum. This patient has had subsequent another 15-pound weight loss, continues to drop his albumin, is now down to an albumin of 2.1. So again, the double balloon is going to give you greater access to deeper in the mucosa where you can really stop and look at things and biopsy this. And this patient has had no other symptoms of recurrent Crohn's disease. He had a resection previously. This turned out to be on biopsy. Let's see the next slide. That turned out to be amyloidosis. So again, Capsule findings in themselves is not going to be adequate to make a diagnosis. You need biopsy findings. Fortunately, with double balloon, we can now do that. Okay, what are we seeing here? Let's do that again. Look on the left side of the screen. You're going to see that outfolding pouch. This is a patient who had three years of crampy postprandial abdominal pain. CAT scans showed mucosal thickening, about 10 centimeters proximal to the ileocecal valve. Let's show it one more time. Look at 12, 11 o'clock. Go ahead. 11 o'clock, 9 o'clock. This was diverticulum, Meckel's diverticulitis seen on, uh, confirmed on surgery. So again, if you have nonspecific findings in the proper context, this is ongoing pain. CAT scan showed some nonspecific findings. You have the ability to do the capsule. If there's any question, again, double balloon. We, we are beyond the era of making guesswork out of capsule endoscopies. Let's see the next one, please. And again, this is going to show it uh, a little more clearly. Okay, next. This is now a 36-year-old woman, had a, a, a resection. Ilio, uh, resection, 15 centimeters proximal to the ileocolic anastomosis. 
Her crit is drifting down. She's had heavy menses. We're not sure her inf what uh, the diagnosis is. She has heavy menses. Her hemoglobin is gradually drifting down. Remember, not every patient has an ileocolic anastomosis that is reachable with your colonoscope. This patient had her ileocolic anastomosis 15 centimeters proximal. You have the ability with a double balloon to reach the area and cauterize this. Again, double balloon, not just for diagnosis, but also for therapeutic means. Let's look at the next slide, please. This is a patient, known Crohn's disease, uh, a great deal of lower extremity arthralgias, has otherwise felt well, is now starting to have some crampy abdominal pain. All the inflammatory markers are normal, and her chief complaint is uh, ongoing arthralgias. Postprandial abdominal pain. Any guesses here? This is what we call a diaphragmatic stricture. Again, diagnosis can be confirmed endoscopically, and we have a uh, the balloon, which can be used for therapeutic purposes here again. So we're at an era where there's no area really of the small bowel that we can't diagnose and uh, confirm by biopsy and then use uh, the double balloon for therapeutic purposes, not just for bleeding, uh, but for dilatation as well. Next slide. This is uh, a patient who was being evaluated for stricture. A capsule had in a patient had mild obstructive symptoms, did not have a uh, pre-capsule patency capsule to distinguish from an obstructive stricture or not. This patient continued to have crampy abdominal pain, and as you could see here again, capsule stuck. Patient continues to have crampy abdominal pain. The capsule is easily removed in most cases with a Roth, Roth basket. The point here to be, uh, to be made is that if you have a patient in whom you are uh, using a capsule, it's essential that we take a good clinical history. If there's any hint of uh, obstructive symptoms, that patient must have a, di a uh, CTE or MR, some cross-sectional imaging, uh, high quality where we, could, we can assure ourselves that there is no luminal narrowing because you end up with uh, this problem. Most patients will have a capsule retention, uh, will not have it impacted in the small bowel stricture. Most of these patients uh, with medical therapy will have some gradual, hopefully, uh, resolution of a, any edema and can pass the capsule. The standard definition for capsule retention is uh, retention beyond two weeks with medical therapy. It's rare that you need to do, and again, this shouldn't happen with cross-sectional imaging when taking the, uh, the proper history. Um, it's uncommon or very rare that the patient will have an acute small bowel obstruction with the capsule. On the other hand, now we have the ability, as we didn't have about six years ago, of removing the capsule and not leaving this capsule in there uh, ad infinitum. So again, to, to summarize, we have capsule, we have small bowel uh, imaging with the standard cross-sectional imaging. We have now the capsule endoscopy well over a decade. It should be our common uh, imaging armamentarium. We should know for sure that the patient does not have any stricturing disease. The history, taking the history is in fact not adequate if there is even a whiff of obstruction or stricture because in the cases where you don't do imaging and there is some history, it's about six to nine percent cases of uh, capsule retention. With the agile patency capsule, that can come down to about one percent. Probably the best way to uh, determine it, whether they'll have a capsule retention, is a very good history followed by uh, a cross-sectional imaging. And again, we have the patency capsule. Patency capsules are uh, effective in ruling out a retained capsule. We now have less fear in terms of putting down a capsule in patients with strictures because we have the relatively easy approach in terms of removing it with a, a double balloon. Remember, capsule is now less worrisome in terms of stricture. We can uh, put down the uh, the double balloon, and now with the double balloon, there should be uh, every area of the small bowel that is within reach uh, of for biopsy, for dilatation, and for control of bleeding, for obscure bleeding uh, in the patient that we've uh, cleared with a uh, upper endoscopy 
and colonoscopy. So I think we've now, uh, in the era that besides upper endoscopy, colonoscopy, there's no reason that we can't evaluate uh, the mucosa throughout the small bowel. And again, the most important uh, feature in terms of making a diagnosis before embarking upon imaging of the small bowel is putting it in the proper clinical context. Thank you.